Good evening, everyone, and welcome to NAVA's Advocacy Program. Oh, I can see there is already a number of people on the chat letting us know where they are. Kerry McKenzie is saying, I bet it's cold in Tassie. I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. It's been quite lovely, actually, in, in, in Melbourne today. Um, and we'll do our bigger, broader introductions later, those of you who've been here several weeks already already know to so let us know in the chat where you are so please please keep doing that as you're coming in and Leia thank you for um, popping the link up to our live captioning we've got Helen in Brisbane again hello Helen uh, offering live captioning I know it can be difficult um, always to keep up with the audio and there is the inevitable technical problem so if you click on that link for the live captioning then you'll be able to see the text um, and, and follow that along as well. Um, oh, there's Michaela from the sunny UK where it is um, 7 a.m. I seem to recall. Very nice to see you, Michaela. Um, oh, Michelle Ball from Elvina Bay in New South Wales. I don't know where that is. Where is that, Michelle? Elvina Bay. There's Vicky from Alexandria, ah, from the Australian Ceramics Association. Hello, Vicky. Andy Vag, it is cold in Tassie. Um, Jackie Bailey, who I'm going to a formal introduction of in just a moment. She, she is in Sydney today. What's the what's the feeling like there, Jackie? Actually, I live in Wollongong, oh, uh, which is to the south of Sydney. No, that's yes. all right. So Darawal country. Um, and it, it's actually been a beautiful day. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, sparkling. Perfect. Uh, and I'm here on uh, Boomerang and uh, uh, Wurrung Wurundjeri country in Melbourne, um, where it's also actually quite quite crisp. Um, oh, hello to Emily from Artspace Mackay. Yes, tropical country Queensland. <laughs> we will draw on that that uh, that warmth. Ah, and Larissa from Ipswich. On the Jagra Yaga and Europol people's land, that is um, also um, it is a it is a big country. It is a very big country, and to be nice and warm up there is uh, is is warming our hearts down here. Um, so we still got. I can see people um, still streaming in, and thank you for letting us know where you are. It's interesting when we first conceived of this program, we thought. We want to bring people together. We want to have some great conversations about what advocacy is, but we also really want to engage people really directly in, in advocacy. Um, and I'm hoping that some people will have done their homework from last week, which was to um, connect with your local member and uh, send them a note either on social media or get in touch with them directly. Um, so if anyone has indeed done that, also let us know on the chat because um, um, we're going to have um, more homework at the end of today uh, to be getting in touch with those people. Um, oh, I can see Gabrielle Sullivan is on the call from Indigenous Art Code from Windy Perth. Uh, on Wajak Nunga lands in, of course, and Perth had that that massive storm. Is everyone okay? There was um, that looked um, uh, that looked absolutely treacherous. Um, I'd not seen. I can't remember when I've seen a storm of that size um, across Australia. Um, <laughs> Uh, I see. Gabrielle wasn't seeking help from Windy Perth. She was actually meaning to say hello, which is kind of the opposite and really glad we clarified that, Gabrielle. So I'm assuming then that Gabrielle is okay uh, and that the storm has passed. Uh, but yeah, that really did look quite, quite extreme, I have to say. Sarah Miller is saying that Port Beach um, was absolutely massacred. Um, and yes, Kerry, it did look like an East Coast low on the West Coast. And I guess this is the thing with um, uh, climate change and global heating that we are seeing very, very different patterns um, across the country. Um, now, the NAVA Advocacy Program has been going for um, oh, six weeks now. I am going to um, uh, show us on the screen um, the, the overall program and we'll be updating um, that handbook um, in a good couple of weeks um, for members. And so here we have um, 
our overall program and and um, where we've uh, where we've been so far. Yeah, I wonder. That's. I hope that is nice and clear. We started. Um, there are four chapters. There are four kind of key sections to the NAVA advocacy program. We're looking at. Um, advocating the arts, we're looking at the, the policy aspects, the media aspects and the political aspects of advocacy so that we are building our advocacy voices and skills and getting a great sense of how do we engage with those policy and um, political mechanisms of decision making that can result in really great long term um, policy in Australia. We started out spending four weeks looking at um, advocacy for the arts in a whole bunch of different contexts, um, starting with um, two key organisations, uh, the Australian Museums and Galleries Association and the National Public Galleries Alliance to look at uh, what are current issues for the sector, what are people advocating for. We then the week after we recapped Arts Day on the Hill last year, the National Day of Advocacy for the Arts, uh, and spoke to Nadina Dixon and Selena de Carvalho, who'd been involved um, as advocates in last year's program. Then on the 6th of May, we looked at First Nations advocacy um, uh, again with Nadina Dixon, um, a Gadigal Rajari UN artist based in Sydney, and with Wesley Enoch, um, uh, uh, Nunak Nugi Man, um, uh, who is also, of course, not just the artistic director of the Sydney Festival, but a member of the NAVA board. Um, I had a great discussion about, um, you know, kind of decades of. Um, of First Nations advocacy. And then as we will be doing at the end of each of our four week um, chapters, a QA and a with a politician looking at um, um, what politicians expect and need to hear from us and also the opportunity to hear from a politician in their language um, about what some, some, some key issues are. This is now our, our next chapter where we're looking at understanding policy development. Last week, um, we had a great conversation with John Daly, the CEO of the Grattan Institute, about broader policy literacy. Where do the arts sit? Um, um, this is, of course, the week with Jackie Bailey. Next week, we're going to look at achieving policy goals from within an invisible portfolio with Mike Murdoch, who is the former secretary of the former Department of Communications and the Arts. And then we will... Um, Wrap up with again a QA with a politician, Maria van Bakinu, who alongside John Alexander is co chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture. And so that will be a, a good set of questions reflecting back on this whole section on policy development. So, and thank you to everyone who keeps coming in and joining us. Please note on the chat where you are, um, where you are. Um, uh, where you've clicked in from or, or, or connecting in from uh, around Australia and, and across the world. And so having had these conversations, having looked at the arts, what are we advocating for? How are we doing that? How does that work for industry groups or artists uh, uh, for and by and within First Peoples communities and, and, and First Nations advocacy for the arts? And then putting that in the context of the of some political responses to that, looking at um, a politician and um, uh, lobbyists and former advisors, um, we've then launched into now the policy context. How does that feed into policy development? Um, uh, so we just had the week on that broader Australian context of how does policy development and and um, and, and think tank work across other industries. And so today we're going to put Australia into that global context um, of where do we sit then internationally? Um, we know that Australia doesn't have um, a written, a, a documented arts and cultural policy at the moment, but there are, of course, as we've said in previous weeks and particularly last week, there are a set of values or assumptions. There is a basis on which um, uh, arts and cultural decisions are being made and there is a, 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 a political basis on which the decision has been made to not have an arts and cultural policy. Whether a policy is written or not, it does, it does exist in some ways. You know, it, it, 
we are within a certain kind of framework. The fact that we can't see it and articulate it is also a political choice. It means that we can't engage with it in ways that other countries can. And so then it makes, um, uh, it makes me very, very happy to be able to welcome Jackie Bailey for today's session. Jackie uh, from the BYP Group uh, is a global cultural policy research and evaluation specialist. Um, the theme for our discussion is global comparisons. Who's doing this well? Let's look at ourselves in that broader context. Um, so Jackie, welcome. It's really, really great to have you. Thanks, Esther. It's so good to be here. And congratulations to you guys on this fantastic program of advocacy upskilling. It's great. I really enjoyed the John Daly um, session, uh, which I watched on Catch Up. He was fantastic. <laughs> oh, good, good. And in fact, you have prompted me to say that, of course, all of our sessions are recorded um, and you can catch up on them all. They are all on our website. There is live captioning um, and that link is just there in the top of the chat. Um, and hello again to Helen in Brisbane, who is doing our live captioning and also there are there will be a, a transcription based on that that will be available from tomorrow but you can also access all of the past ones um and uh yes they are they are all there thank you to Leah who has just posted that link so you can catch up on all of our weekly workshop recordings on the website right there so then let's launch straight into um that that global conversation where um, where does Australia sit, I guess, in, um, um, let, let's talk about the, the global conversation before we look at, um, at specific examples from, from other countries. What, in what contexts um, are the officials and others of, of different countries, ministers, ambassadors, having global policy conversations about the arts and, and what kind of role does Australia have in those? What, what's the What's the global policy context in which we sit? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so what is the global co policy context in which we sit? Um, there's a few different forums, I suppose, that those sorts of policy conversations take place. And it sort of depends a little bit on the wealth of your nation as well as the cultural background of your nation, mm -hmm. which conversation you're kind of you know, most going to get most out of. So there's like the multilateral forums. So, you know, the UNESCO kind of UN forums, like in jet, there's a, there's a few of those. Um, and they are kind of more, and then there's the, uh, in that space, quite often the dialogue is around cultural rights. And that's quite useful in countries with, with early democracies, I suppose. And then what you find in later stage sort of high capitalist societies like Australia and the US is at leaving those multilateral conversations, like having less to do with them, which is something else we can talk about later. Um, but for there is, a, there is a period there where the UN forums are very useful, uh, not just for information sharing, but also for advocacy, for internal advocacy within the country. Um, so there's those forums. Then there's um, you, your kind of your IFICA, the International Federation for Arts and Cultural Agencies, which is a membership body which Magdalena Moreno um, is the chair of, and at the moment they're headquartered in Australia, in Sydney. Um, I should say she she's the executive director. The chair is uh, Simone Brault from uh, Arts Council of Canada. That's right, um, and. Sorry, yes, good distinction. And they um, th they serve their members. So that's a fantastic forum for peer-to-peer -peer learning and networking. And again, you've got different sort of subgroups based on regions as well as kind of wealth differentials in terms mm. of what is going to be of interest to those different forums. Um, and Australia's, I mean, Australia's a member of all of these forums. Australia has a long history of wanting to be a good international citizen in terms of participating that has tailed off a little bit at the UN multilateral level and there's a lot more interest in uh, regional and bilateral and kind of um, smaller group I guess groupings based on interest and and like like to like sort of um, forums I mean there's a there's a lot of other forums but those are the kind of main ones yeah that those kind of conversations happen within 
Sarah Miller is just noting that she's never forgotten attending the cultural policy ministers meeting in Shanghai in 2004. Australia was not represented. We also abstained from supporting protection and maintenance of Indigenous culture at UNESCO. Australia has a shameful record, Sarah mm. says. Jackie, tell us a bit more in the context of that <laughs> about what you mean by cultural rights. Um, yeah. And where is Australia's place when it comes to, um, uh, yes, how do you how do you front up on First Nations cultural rights? Yeah, rights no worries. Don't have an ICIP framework even even here. Um, Sarah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess when I say Australia has a, a good history of that, that was kind of back from the Doc Evatt days. Um, you know, post World War Two, establishing the UN. <laughs> Um, and when I say in more recent times, I'm kind of dating that back to the Howard government. Uh, as soon as the Howard government came in, that participation declined and there was a really um, like an overt stepping away from uh, from being dictated to, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. Like there's, a, there's a couple of reasons for that, uh, particularly in the environmental space where activists were using UN um, treaties that Australia was signatory to to try and change uh, federal law um, mm. in Tasmania about the Tamar Valley. Anyway, mm. maybe that's a whole other conversation. Well, it's a related conversation, but anyway, mm. that kind of drove um, the Australian government away from its UN obligations, I guess. And um, there are a number of um, UN bills of rights. Um, the, there's one on economic rights and there's one on cultural rights, the ICCPR. Um, and then they have attached protocols as well. And what you can do is you can sign them, but you don't have to embed them in your legislation. And um, what Australia has done is, is that, is the latter. We've signed them, but we haven't embedded them in our actual legislation. So locally, they don't have any real efficacy in a court of Australian law apart from as a statement of intent. Mm. If, there, if there are any legal experts, just jump in and correct me if I've got that <laughs> wrong because that's my very, you know, rudimentary International Law 101 understanding of it. Um, I was going to give a, a non-legal <laughs> analogy, which is like, you know, when you befriend someone on Facebook, uh, so it's like, yeah, on the list, we're totally friends, but then you meet them. So you're not actually listening. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. And then there's ghosting, which is looks like what we did. Um, <laughs> we totally ghosted. Saying, That's right. Yeah, you know, when you come to my party, of course I'll come to your party. <laughs> to <show> um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's the different levels. And um and I'd say we're that that's kind of we're not but what I would say is those tools, um, they are they are very effective and useful in terms of um advocacy actually but if your country is not you know keen on that kind of being told what to do by a multilateral organization then it's not gonna help you in your advocacy unfortunately which is a and shame but and that's been a really disappointing shift in the rhetoric, hasn't it? To go from mm. uh, a notion, and particularly post-World War II, where there was a very strong sense that international cooperation is a good thing, that there are a range of, you know, wicked problems and global opportunities that we all share and partake in, that if we can form global cooperations, we'll all be the richer. And look, we contribute and then we are strengthened and empowered and enriched by that. And yet lately, and now I'm just thinking of the last couple of years of um, Trump, Johnson and um, Morrison in Australia, certainly we could spend, you know, the next hour talking about Brexit, but let's not. Um, the, um, the, the issue around this notion of um, negative globalism that Trump used and then our Prime Minister simply parroted and this notion that, well, we can just stand up in a bullish way and say, well, we're not going to do what those countries tell us, even though we have contributed to that, <laughs> yeah. contributed to an agreement on, on best practice. So then um, how, um, how do we then uh, make best use of what those global agreements are in an advocacy context where um, it can just be reacted to with such a petulance. I think that's been something that's really difficult to, I, I certainly find one of the most difficult aspects of advocacy is when you can put forward a great argument and the response is, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tend to talk about um, 
you know, going for the sympathetic middle, Esther. <laughs> so <laughs> you've got your 20% or 10%, which, you know, you're never going to change their minds or it's going to, it would be so hard to change their minds that you know, so don't even go there. Um, then you've got the people who are on your side, love what you do, love your work. And then you've got your sympathetic middle, which is a say 60%, this is made up numbers. And they're, you know, if if you kind of started talking to them and started informing them, then they're probably going to be sympathetic to what you think. And it's how to push them into action. That's what I think about in, in advocacy terms, how to take that sympathetic yeah. medal from just being sympathetic to being active on your behalf. Um, yeah, that's that's where I think energy is best spent. And I don't, I, I just wouldn't use a rights argument in that context. I don't, and I think, you know, there's a larger, much larger discourse that goes on around rights and, um, you know, the, the utility of, of the rights discourse in terms of advocacy and change. And I think rights are incredibly important when it comes to, you know, legal, legal, um, yeah. the legal system mm -hmm. and justice and that sort of situation. But I do find if you're going to talk about rights, you have to talk about responsibilities. And that's where people get their backs up really quickly. They're like, well, you're talking about all your rights, but you've got an obligation yourself to, you know, contribute to the economy, blah, blah, blah. And you just get a really polarised conversation really quickly, which is suited for an adversarial context, like a courtroom. But I don't think it's suited for like human to human trying to convince one other person of where you're coming from. And I think that it's better off, you're better off finding shared ground in in that kind of person to person advocacy. I'm not saying it doesn't have a place in advocacy, but I, I don't, personally, I don't know if it's a great place to go in Australia right now. <laughs> if you're trying to if you, if you want to actually affect change. Um, but I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. That's just kind of what, yeah, what, what the um, vibe is. <laughs> look, I think I think that's absolutely right. And, and your term there about that 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 sympathetic, uh, you know, and finding that sympathetic middle, I think, is incredibly important. We're, we're in an era of politics at the moment, which is very much about, um, um, again, that that kind of petulance, that easy, dismissive uh, attitude to something that might seem a bit too complicated. We have a prime minister who has explicitly used the language of quiet Australians who are not complaining about their rights. You know, this is verbatim something that the Prime Minister has said. And so um, to be talking, um, yeah, uh, to, to be advancing um, an advocacy or policy conversation from a, from a rights-based approach is not going to have, uh, is not going to meet with a sympathetic response and is not going to shift um, uh, yeah, that, that thinking. Um, I, I completely agree. One of the conversations, uh, this reminds me that I got into a couple of years ago when visiting Canada, um, and hello to any Canadians um, who may be um, with us this evening. Um, at, well, which I'm assuming there'll be none because you will be fast asleep. It's the middle of the night there at the moment. Um, uh, you know, six, 17 hours ago. Um, but in Canada, um, there is something called the status of the artist um, legislation, which is um, also a, a UNESCO framework, which was reviewed towards the end of last year. And I haven't had a chance to have a really good look at it. So status of the artist is, um, oh, there we go. We've got half a Canadian. Marina Robbins is Canadian, but living in New South Wales. <laughs> Excellent. This is good. Any other half Canadians? My sister lives in Canada, so part of my heart is in Canada. Um, um, status of the artist, which is a UNESCO, um, is it, 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 it's got the status of a convention, hasn't it? Um, it's, um, I forget it's, it, its specific UNESCO status, but it's about governments introducing um, legislation that says, um, this is what it means to carry out business as an, as an artist. This is what um, this is how we value artists, um, and what it's designed to do is to um, allow different different areas, different different portfolios of government to, when they're working with or interfacing with us, to refer to that legislation and say, you know, this is this is what it you know this this is the status that the, the an artist has. Um, you know, across different areas of interfacing with government. Um, and I was in a lot of conversations about wouldn't it be great if um, Australia introduced such a thing here? And my response was always, you know, this isn't the political, um, 
this isn't the, the current political environment for even going in that direction. <laughs> It's just that it's just it's absolutely fanciful that, that we could achieve that in the next little while. Um, but Jackie, what are some um, other ways in which um, countries um, uh, around the world in, in, in your scope of interest, what are some very uh, different analogous interesting models for arts and cultural policy um, that we really should be looking at, whether it's a politically uh, and now a, a particularly, you know, sort of supportive environment for them or not. How are others doing it? Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, it's a broad canvas. Um, I'd say the, the ones that I tend to pay most attention to are first world countries. So apologies to you guys if, if you're not living in a first world country, but I will speak to the developing world as well in, in a minute. But my mind, I do tend to focus on the OECD countries um, and, you know, the European and the English speaking countries, just in terms of, um, you know, what's what Australia is kind of most similar to. Um, and in those contexts, it's the Europeans who are kind of ahead of the game, like top of the class, yep. if you like. Um, and it, that's not to be, that's, you know, it's completely expected because so much of their history. So what I do see is countries where history and identity are, uh, closely wrapped up with culture um, and architecture, <laughs> you know, beautiful buildings and types of food and language. Those countries have, um, you know, significant cultural spending and cu cultural, you know, they, of course they have ministries of culture, you know, of course they do. They wouldn't, wouldn't dream of not having that. Um, you know, so countries like Austria, France, um, Poland actually is really interesting. They're, um, spending, they're one of the highest spenders on the uh, kind of COVID-19 emergency funding for the arts and cultural sector after Austria. So it kind of goes Austria, then Poland. And that's not including Germany. Germany's spending so much money that I kind of don't even put them on the charts. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> it's just like they've they just, their partner sat down and gone, mm, how can we spend as much money as the rest of the world put together? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so yeah, so those countries where they have a strong and Poland is interesting, I find because for them it's more about uh, it's it's kind of almost a defensive measure, if you like, because mm. they're such a small little country. You know, Germany, Russia, constantly having to say we're not German, we're not Russian, we're not Prussian, we're Polish, and so they really support arts and culture as as kind of as a result in a way. Then you've got. Um, China, which spends a huge amount on like everything, so including arts and culture, and that's a that's um, one of their five pillars of um, it's it's a soft power pillar. So that's about outward facing, showing the world that we are a cultural power, that um, that we have cultural status. Um, you know, for the academics in the group, it's it's a lot of there's a lot of um, symbolic capital that um, that some countries. Uh, spend on culture in order to earn that kind of symbolic capital and that that status. So I think John Daly last week was talking a lot about status markers and legacy. And, and you know, still to this day, a lot of the reasons why countries all around the world uh, have more or less for their cultural funding is to kind of is to do with that. So Austria, you know, incredible history of classical music and architecture, all these things. So they spend a lot on arts and culture. It's kind of obvious. Um, then you do have some really interesting examples in South America as well, like Brazil um, has this really cool culture points program, which which I mean, I'm not from Brazil. I haven't been to Brazil, but it sounds like an amazing program where it's really trying to democratize um, and and also achieve some sustainability and poverty goals with cultural policy. So I know we don't like arts for instrumental outcomes, but of course arts is part of you know quality of life and um, arts and cultural policy can achieve multiple goals. So they kind of do that. They have these cultural points. So they, they might fund, you know, like a, a Samba school in, in a village or whatever it might be like, you know, really grassroots stuff all the way through. I really like that as well. Um, what you, what I do see a lot of in kind of the more developing countries, uh, like in Africa and, and some of the some of Southeast Asia, is uh, 
quite a lot of connection between cultural policy and um, sustainable development goals. So, you know, aid and not aid, but development and um, addressing poverty and just completely reasonable and fair enough. Um, the other thing I see, and this again goes to kind of the the policy context of of a country is quite a few countries have social insurance policies, which artists are part of and which I think is a really interesting area um, because I do think this crisis is pushing people, to, uh, pushing countries to think about a universal basic income in a yeah. much more serious way than they have before, you know, and we're talking about like serious, serious um, economists, like neoliberal economists and, you know, the Warren Buffetts of the world saying we actually do need a universal basic income. Um, so I feel like that is a conversation that would be a great one to have and arts and culture could really benefit from that because there are a number of countries that have social insurance schemes already for artists so that's like a lot of the european countries including the eastern european countries um canada a couple of the south american countries so that would be kind of incredible um <laughs> if we had that i often think about um i grew up in brisbane and powderfinger uh was a band kind of emerging when i was um in my in my youth and you know they they always said that if it hadn't been for the doll you know they would never have managed to become a band and produce the music that they did you know it took them 10 years to 15 years to write my happiness like i knew them when they before they were famous <laughs> you know what i mean like it's that it's that kind of universal social insurance i think which can make a big difference so there are these fields of policy that sort of encircle cultural policy, which can really help arts and culture as well. And you just I could keep talking, it. but you, you, you direct <laughs> me because otherwise I'll just keep going. <laughs> oh, that's so much better to unpack. Um, but you've just outlined there a whole bunch of different principles by which um, you would um, have or value or evaluate, I guess, an arts and cultural policy. So talking about uh, soft power and cultural diplomacy, looking at cultural identity, looking at cultural maintenance, looking at particularly in European countries where there is not just that competitiveness among each other, but then that wanting to preserve what is culturally unique about um, you know, a particular country. There's um, broader social good and social utility um, and um, you know that's before we even get into things like health education mental health and so on but you know that's um, I think a really great overview Jackie of um, nations that have for some time valued um, um, arts and culture as an industry, artists as individuals, the work of arts in that broader context um, a couple of questions that I'm just going to pick up on um, and then um, go towards that question of, um, you know, because uh, we've, we've um, it's now 34 past the hour and we have hardly at all talked about COVID-19, which I think, <laughs> is, um, I think we've just all, uh, you know, there's a number of us here on the line. I think we, we, we've all just broken a record for the past three months, <laughs> the longest time someone's gone without talking about the crisis. So we're going to extend <laughs> that period um, and, and, and defer that conversation for a little minute. Um, Kerry Kent is asking about Japan, uh, who also has oh, Japan. policies. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my lamp so that I'm not like, you know, <laughs> so, I'm going to turn mine on soon too. There it's getting, getting dark. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, any good. Anyway, um, Japan is spending, Japan's interesting. They just announced like, well, not just, but, you know, in the last little while they announced, this is a COVID related thing, but they, they announced like 50 million euros or something for arts and culture and screen and stuff. But then they also announced like 950, I'm going to just check my numbers, but it's like 950 or 750 million euros for global market creation, global demand creation and promotion of content. Eight, sorry, okay. So 880 million is what they, they just announced, which is a huge amount of money, like coming after Poland and Austria, of course. But um and global demand creation, like what is that? I love that <laughs> question. 
I'd love to hear if anybody else knows more about it. Yeah, (laughs) global demand creation. It's Um, yes. You all want our stuff. We will we will measure your demand. It's kind of very market development um, type of Yeah. That is super interesting because, of course, in a situation, um, just zooming back into Australia for a while, in a situation where we're not going to have international tourism for some time, of course, our states, those who have um, release packages, which I think all of them now are, of course, going to be eyeing off one another quite competitively for uh, tourism. And Victoria have announced a $150 million um, experience economy mm. package, mm. which is kind of like... Um, you know, almost almost the opposite. Um, you know, it's um, building global demand would would have to be around um, you know a range of you know that understanding of of culture for export, um, and that's also something that in Australia we have not done particularly well. When we look at cultural diplomacy and, and, and the role of arts and culture there, it's just not been um, uh, something that that we've done in a concerted way. It's been a bit stop start, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, let's, now let's go back to that notion of artist insurance, universal basic income and the countries who are doing this well. I know in countries like France there is a notion of a um, a, a guaranteed annual income and so you've got this, um, you know, if you um, opt into this program, you are declaring that you're an artist, there is a... Um, a guaranteed annual income that the government will declare, will sorry, will guarantee for you. Um, but if you drop below that, you are able to claim something. I mean, Jackie, doesn't that isn't that just such a clear message of how important the artist is and the work of the artist is to France? Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, and but it's not just France. Like it's um, it's a whole lot of countries mm, do that. Mm. You know, like Estonia and Croatia, and just flicking through my list, like loads of countries have that. Canada has that kind of. Setup. Yeah, and, Roman um, Colston's mentoring Finland, saying that the case studies from Finland's UBI trial a few years ago are interesting, especially with how artists were able to make more work because they were less worried about money. We've got this yeah. notion here of. Um, you know, uh, doll bludges and so on. That if you actually yeah. went on the doll, you'd be you'd, you'd you'd be lazy. In fact, no, you'd be freed up. To no, get... and I mean, there's a whole well, um, whole huge amount of research into uh, creativity and the conditions that are best for creativity. And one of them is, um, you know, removing those kind of ex- external pressures or just balancing them, like having positive external pressures rather than negative ones. So you have to be able to, you have to have your hierarchy of needs, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, psychology 101. You have to have survival taken care of before you can create. Like it's really, all the research says that. And I've seen it amongst my friends as well who are writers because I'm a writer and I've got writer friends who are just, um, you know, of course COVID has been hard, but at the same time, after a couple of weeks of adjustment, they've kind of settled into, you know, they can access Job Seeker without having to, whatever it is, apply for jobs every other five minutes. And um, and they can just actually produce work. They produce so much more work than in the last two years. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, but yes, the social insurance thing, it's, it's very widespread. It's not like it's this weirdo, you know, left-wing idea. It's, it's I mean, Japan has it. it well, lots of countries have this yeah. kind of thing. I mean, you do have to live in a country that uh, is okay with, with, tax, with tax, you know, <laughs> if you're going to do it. So people have to be okay with tax. And, you know, there's, there's another conversation in Australia about who's being taxed and, you know, company tax and stuff. Um Yeah, if we get a chance, I also just want to talk a little bit about um, what cultural policies are doing well in terms of First Nations and cultural diversity as well. But we can come back to that if if you've got other questions around this kind of collective uh, insurance. Oh, no, look, let's tackle that now. And then I I am going to segue us to uh, the the COVID-19 response. Um, (laughs) On on First Nations, I just want to remind everyone that um, the First Nations Arts Awards are on tonight. Um, That is live stream presented by the Australia Council. All the information is on the Australia Council's website. Um, That 
um, that starts at six o'clock. Um, so if come six o'clock, um, you are not completely over sitting in front of the screen, um, then uh, yeah, do uh, do join that. It's obviously the first time it's been live streamed. It's gonna be fantastic to see. But yes, Jackie, um, let's talk about um, um, First Nations and um, the broader um, and, and, and distinct cultural diversity agenda of cultural policy. I think it's something that, um, again, oh, and thank you to Leia for including the link there to the First Nations um, Arts Awards and Sarah Miller for pointing out that Niran is reopening um, as well soon. So that is the Biennale of Sydney. Um, yeah, we for um, for a place that our politicians like to crow about as being one of the most successful multicultural nations on earth. We've got politicians from all sides um, for, uh, of, of, the, of the political spectrum who like to, you know, lay claim to that, and yet we don't. We just have not had consistently great policy in this area. Not for a while. No, I mean, not really since the. 70s i'd say or maybe even early 80s if i'm being yeah, generous yeah yeah what do you reckon sort of i haven't i don't really think we've had a multicultural policy since since then <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of us, you know, you, you look back on the, the 80s and 90s and um, the, the arts as an industry uh, was actually more diverse uh, back then. It's something that, um, you know, there are only a small number of us, um, uh, you know, cult culturally and linguistically diverse um, in, in, in leadership positions in the arts mm. industry, let alone in staff more broadly. And Diversity Arts Australia has done some useful benchmarking uh, on this and those reports are available on, on their website. Um, but yes, tell us about um, uh, that in that broader global context. Yeah, no worries. So, yeah, and that's, um, we did that research with darts actually, and it was oh, I mean, of course. what you'd expect, but you know, it's still pretty disturbing. Um, well, it's kind of interesting because the country, like Australia it does, is pretty good with multiculturalism if you think about it in terms of, you know, if your benchmark is civil unrest and, <laughs> you know, actually killing each other, like it's it's not exactly on a par with the Balkans, you know, doing doing pretty well there. Oh, um, yeah, on the, on the not killing each other measure. <laughs> on the not killing each other. Well, yeah, we're doing great. We have our moments, but, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, there's obviously you can do better than that. Um, I'd say the countries that are kind of colonial, uh, colonised, coloniser cultures mm. um, that are doing better than Australia would, well, kind of all of them, like the UK and Canada <laughs> and Pick New one. Zealand. They're all doing better. Well, I mean, I'm just being flippant now. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, they're coloniser cultures, so it's not like they get gold star for you know, in, in that regard. But, I mean, it's sort of like, it's almost like proportionate to the amount of colonial guilt is like how, how much better they are at it or something. I don't know, like the UK is actually very good when it comes to um, standards and benchmarking for cultural diversity um, in, in their arts and film funding. So, yeah, that's quite interesting. They've got really extensive, like, statistical uh, collection that happens and reporting and um, the BFI, the British Film Institute, has a really great three-tick system. So if you want to see that stuff, have a look at that. Um, yes, and they, of course, Arts Council England, have done some naming and shaming. Uh, yeah. when they have put their measures out. They have then said, and this is how the industry is looking um, and this is what needs to change. Yeah, so that's good. And Canada um, and New Zealand, obviously very good, well, I, they look to me like they're very good at, um, or better than us anyway, when it comes to First Nations arts and culture and placing that at the heart of cultural policy. Um, I'd even say in the US, the conversation around, at least around people of colour, is more sophisticated um, than it is here in terms of the discussion is around, you know, equity as opposed to just really basic recognition here. It's still yeah. very basic here. Um not not everywhere like and that you know it's it's lumpy and sometimes it's better in other places than it is but yeah overall i'd say um it's unfortunate because it's a place that australia is has such an opportunity for leadership um yeah. such an opportunity also in an economic and a market sense you know it's like the one distinctive niche 
advantage, if you like, in an economic sense in, a, in the global arts marketplace that Australia has. Um, that and its multiculturalism. And, yeah, it's just a shame. I often think that's... It's not... It's not I mean, I think we're doing better and better at it, but not so much at the government level. It's kind of more happening from the actual artists and so on. Yeah, yeah. And that's institutions. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I'm always so heartened by um, the uh, the next generations of artists and arts workers um, who are either uh, newly arrived migrant and, and refugee and emerging language communities or uh, several generations um, who are looking around and saying, well, no, uh, this is actually, you know, the, the Australia that we are creating together is Australia. Um, uh, that um, regressive political conversation is the minority. And, um, uh, to take us now uh, into the COVID-19 discussion, a situation like this, um, you know, this kind of crisis, which has been, um, you know, the most debilitating thing to happen to our cultural life that many of us have ever experienced. Um, this is um, very much one of those um, moment of truth type situations where you think, right, it's a... Um, this is a moment where we can really judge um, a nation's political leadership. What are they choosing to prioritise and what are they not choosing to prioritise? How do they understand how arts and culture work? And if we look at culture more broadly, how do they understand the ways in which we connect with each other, express ourselves, um, you know, the, 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 from, from the contest of identity to the development of, you know, uh, innovation, technologies, audiences, uh, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, Australia's federal government response to the arts and culture sector um, has been um, enormously disappointing and seriously problematic. It flies in the face of um, all evidence, all sense, and the industry has been quite united and clear in, in um, in, in communicating what the industry needs are. Um, so tell us, Jackie, how are other countries responding on yeah. our culture and what opportunities are they realising um, at the moment in understanding this as one of those, you know, once in several lifetimes mm. rare opportunity um, to, um, to, to really foreground um, culture at this time? Um, can I do the screen share thingy? Yeah, because right? I want to show you my screen. graph. Because of course I've Love got a graph. graph. Love so, it. Uh, screen sharing. Open a browser. All right, we're going to press some buttons now and we're going to hope that everyone can see as Jackie is sharing her screen, please let us know on the chat whether you're able to see that. At the moment, I've just got a, I've, I've got a white screen so far and I've got Jackie in the corner and now I can see it says you are sharing your screen and it's all a bit of an infinite regress where I can see me in the corner and then me in the corner of that corner. Kerry's asking, can we get a copy of the graph? And yes, we will make this available uh, in our package um, for now the members tomorrow um, can you so, see the graph can you make it much bigger yes maybe like make it fill your whole kind of screen there um because it's and and maybe just expand the yeah expand the the dialogue box that it's yeah that's it andy vag is already seeing the uh the trend there um, can you see that how is that, everyone? We're getting some, yeah, goods and can see screen, which is can great. Can see screen. Excellent. Oh, for some reason I can hear myself now, which is very disconcerting. Okay. Uh, yes, because it's your echo coming back on your, yes, because you're sharing everything, including your audio. Oh, I don't know how to undo that. Let's, oh, okay. let's, let's bear with it and just enjoy the lovely sound of your voice and then okay. we'll, we'll share it for the length of time it takes to communicate right, with okay. that and then we'll just so, this is um, so I've been collecting data on what countries have been do, what governments have been doing in response to the impact of COVID on the arts and cultural sectors. And this is just a graph I put together on the countries. There are 29 countries that I found details about who actually have art specific funding packages. So this doesn't include countries where they've got 
just social insurance measures because I right. couldn't quantify that. These are countries who just have, oh, sorry, who, who do have arts funding announcements, you know, um, and it do also doesn't include um, six countries that announce kind of mixed packages. So Canada, Scotland, and Estonia, South Africa, Belgium, and Germany. Actually, they all had um, mixed packages, you know, arts and sport and heritage kind of thing. So from this graph, you can see in terms of the total funding packages, um, we've got Austria at the top of the chart, probably Germany is ahead of that. And Australia is down here, sort of two thirds of the way down. Can you see us there? Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, now, when we look at per capita, which I find a sort of a better comparative um, approach, I also look at percentage of GDP, but I'm not going to get into that now. Um, so on this one, Australia, oh, sorry, Austria, Austria is obviously still head of the charts. Wow, look at that. I mean, the, massive, uh, I know. They're the spending so of... much money. Wow. And this is the COVID um, funding. And Australia is still about two thirds of the way down. So that didn't help us much because often Australian governments will say, oh, but you know, per capita, we're spending so much, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, no. Nah. Okay, so that's enough of graphs and screen sharing. And I will that, that's on my blog and you can share it with everybody. Great. Well, Jackie, thanks for showing us that because it's kind of, you know, grim and also no, no great surprise, isn't it? Because, of course, um, the only thing that Australia has put out at the federal level. Um, oh, um, Marge, um, I'm just, sorry, I misunderstood Marg's question. Uh, so apologies, Marg. Uh, Marg was asking whether you've added up um, what each state government has put together at, or no. are, you, are you only looking at federal government? Yeah, because I was I'm just looking at national wide. governments. Yeah, I, I think, think that's, I'm uh, still sharing my audio. No, no. Oh, 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 you're, oh you know, you're, you're, it's sounding fine at this end. Um, but yes, yeah, sorry, Mark, I misunderstood your question. So, and I can see why Jackie's done that because otherwise you would have to go into every um, every government and also calculate what all their states and provinces are doing, which would just be uh, really difficult to find that that information. And of course, at the federal level, the only About. thing Australia has done and, and some cities as well in my blog like just in the general information from each country yeah. but i didn't sum it up into the totals i just did that for the national government yeah no f fair enough um so yes the only thing australia has done is that 27 million dollars uh which was 10 million for uh the, the donation into support act and i hope everyone knows that support act their well-being helpline is now open for to all artists and art forms, not just live music. So that's that's um, really fantastic. And then the seven million for Iveus, the um, Indigenous Visual Arts um, uh, program, which is run by the Office for the Arts, and then the ten million for the Regional Arts Fund. Um, but when you talk about an industry that's you know more than one hundred billion dollars in size, um, twenty seven million is of course not a um, not a COVID support package um, at all. It's an absolute drop in the ocean, does not respond to what the industry has been saying. Oh, thank you to, um, um, uh, yes, thank you to Leah for popping in the article to Ben Eltham's article today. Uh, which oh, it was yesterday, yeah, it's a good Leah. article. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Um, and, um, how is um, how's now your experience of your audio at your end, Jackie? All all restored? Yay! Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so then that is that graph was a, a, a clear demonstration of everything we've just been talking about. So Austria spending a lot because they want to make sure that this crisis doesn't result in uh, an encroaching of German uh, and, and other neighbouring cultures. <laughs> um, but there's also a whole bunch of other levers that governments can pull when it comes to arts and cultural policy. And one of those that, that we've seen disappointingly pulled in Australia has been the suspension of content quotas for free to air and subscription TV for Australian um, documentary, drama and kids programming. Um, 
in Europe, of course, um, there is a great deal of public subsidy and public broadcasters for specifically that reason, so that um, people aren't just colonised by American things on, on, on Netflix. Um, is that something that you've had a look at, Jackie, not specifically on, on broadcast, but on, I guess, um, industry measures around, um, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the distribution um, of um, cultural product, to use that expression? I guess it goes back to that, that Japanese example, well, of building the global demand. Yeah, 800 million euros. <laughs> that still blows my mind. Um, yeah, no, I have had a look at that. And, yeah, it, it hasn't escaped international attention. I was reading uh, one of the international federations, I think it was a European one, was commenting on how, you know, all the different things that countries have been doing, but also how in some instances there have been kind of rollbacks and they mentioned Australia's removal of local content quota restrictions as one of those examples. Yeah, yeah Australia, international example. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, but I have seen some interesting things um, from some countries in like in that kind of online space, like trying to aggregate content and, and disseminate it, mostly for their local population. Like we do have countries in, in Europe where a lot of it is to do with with um, self-presentation and soft power and you know, it's about the local pride but it's also about showing a face to the rest of Europe you know we're better than you kind of thing um, but then there are countries who are just doing it for them you know for themselves for their own populations and uh, I, want, I wonder if I can show you I might try the screen sharing thing again unless Ooh. it's too too terrible um just want to show you the egyptian ministry of cultures got this like this youtube channel that they've set up um and they've had 25 million visitors in the two months since they set it up um, which is pretty cool so there's there's quite a few ministries that have done that sort of thing that have um set up you know like the bbc arts culture in quarantine um it's kind of an online platform for for seeing an arts content um there's you are sharing your screen does that mean you can see it there's a little thinky circle that seems to be happening uh so it looks like it's still yes and now i can see egyptian ministry of culture what about yeah. everyone else can everyone see that let us know in the chat um yes okay lovely okay. so they've yes. got um you know they set this up a couple months ago i think as far as I understand it, and they've got a hundred thousand subscribers, and um, they're just getting their getting their, their stuff out there for their own people. Sorry, you don't need to see that. Um, this this is the Polish one, oh. <laughs> which I really like because go Poland, like teeny tiny country, <laughs> squashed yeah. by everybody else. And they've got this really great website. I'm just going to scroll down. The games that made us Polish. Oh. You know? I mean, there's a lot of nationalism going on, and yeah. I think that's going to be yeah. a little bit scary. Like, to yeah. be honest, in the ne in the coming few years, is I'd say there's going to be quite a rise of nationalism, um, which the arts can either help or hinder. Um, probably a bit of both. Um, but in, in a cynical sense, that kind of nationalist agenda will that 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 might be a lever essentially of getting more funding for the arts and then doing what artists always do, which is kind of subvert um, subvert the paradigm. So. Oh, precisely. It's kind of, you know, it's interesting. Part of me has been thinking these last few weeks, you know, we've got a prime minister who is, um, you know, quite chauvinistic, nationalistic in that very bland, you know, kind of sense. Um, what's that catchphrase of his? Um, Oh, it's on two of my, oh, how good is Australia? You know, like just this very bland kind of, um, uh, you know, make America great kind of um, notion. But when he says how great is Australia, he's not actually, you know, it's entirely a rhetorical question. He's not actually interested in a response from the people who make Australia great, <laughs> the people who create Australia's future um, and who are, of course, um, uh, creating work um, that gives Australia a global reputation. You know, we've got, as we all know, and as many of you here are represented, we've got artists and arts organisations 
in our regions, in our cities who have bigger global reputations and profiles than they do in Australia. Um, you know, there are organisations who, um, you know, I'm sure artists uh, could, you know, in, in Poland could probably name, whereas um, our Prime Minister could not. And so on the one hand, as you say, Jackie, it's kind of, it's probably a good thing that arts and culture have not been co-opted for, um, you know, that kind of nationalistic purpose. But on the other hand, if we reflect back a few years to um, some of the really problematic things that Tony Abbott as Prime Minister and then not as Prime Minister used to say about the public broadcasters, particularly about the ABC. Uh, the ABC is doing such an incredible job, especially right now and have been for some time, that of course the government have long felt threatened by them uh, and have wanted to cut their funding in different ways. And unfortunately, have succeeded in, in cutting their funding in different ways. And, and certainly, uh, you know, the arts industry is also successful on a range of measures. We're also really shit at self-exploitation, which means we keep creating more with less. Um, but it almost means that, you know, that in, in, in some sense, they don't need to engage on, on a nationalistic level. But what Tony Abbott used to say about the ABC is, um, oh, they really, you know, when they were being critical of government, he used to, you know, put on Tony Abbott's pouty face and say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're letting the side down, you know, they really should be Team Australia. They really should be cheering for us so confusing a public broadcaster for a state broadcaster yeah that's right um that sort of statecraft versus just a robust democracy <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. they're two and different so things very different things <laughs> and so then if we um reflect back on everything that we've just talked about we've looked at um some of the principles by which um countries around the world uh, invest in the arts and value the arts so we've talked about um uh the lack of a written policy in australia and the way that that sometimes manifests we've talked about just now uh the dollar differentials between what australia is spending and what other countries are spending during this crisis and again some of the the, the, the principles by by which they do that let's now zoom back on australia and what does that global context tell us about what australia's arts and cultural policy is so if we can judge it if we can judge it by its absence and with all the examples that we've just given, what is our arts and cultural policy in Australia at the moment? You're asking the wrong person. Like, <laughs> if anyone has an answer to that, like, let us know. Who's got the answer to that? No, I mean, I do think that Australia, like, to be fair, we've had, we do have strong bipartisan support for funding the arts and culture. Um, you know, ever since OzCo was set up as the Elizabethan Trust, like whatever it was, 60 years ago? No, more than that. Anyway, um, so Australia at the national level does support arts and culture um, or actually support, like acknowledges that it's an appropriate area of government intervention. I'll say that. <laughs> acknowledges that it is an area of, pub, of, of public good where there is a market failure and um, government should therefore intervene to support it. I don't think um, Australia has much more of an articulation of a policy than that. Like there's not a, there's not a strong cultural diplomacy aspect to our arts and cultural policy. Um, a lot of cultural policy is driven by the very dedicated um, bureaucrats and peak sector body people like yourselves um, and artists, a lot of it is driven from there, you know, this push towards equity and cultural cultural democracy and um, uh, cultural representation and diversity. That's not coming from above, that's coming from below. So yeah. cultural policy in Australia is very much shaped by uh, the people in the cultural sector. And I guess that's why it becomes problematic in Australia when the cultural sector is not representative of the Australian population, you know, yeah. when the leaders are not, are by and large still white. Yeah. Um, not that there's, a, um, you know, some of my best friends are white, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> still, you know, but you know what I mean? Like it's, that is, yeah. so unless you do have um, strong leadership from above, 
it's going to come from below and you know that has pros and cons really um in australia we we lack um kind of the collective action um sort of trade union style of of activism that you see of influencing cultural policies in other countries and influencing policies in australia in other workforces yeah. it's so hard to do that and you know places like nava do do some of that but um you know you're not exactly supported to in australia it's like collective action is not really like yay collective action in australia <laughs> i look at the latest potential reforms reforms to industrial relations anyway um so yeah. so that that's a thing as well um which i think is could potentially be an area of opportunity in in that kind of cultural policy space but again not top down bottom grassroots led and possibly with some support from some very dedicated bureaucrats that you have working in this country of support to support collective action. So, you know, collective schemes for portable long service leave and, yes. and social insurance for artists. You could, you know, that that is something that government doesn't have to prescribe that you could potentially set up um, as each state government has done in the community sector and the construction sector. Um, arts could could try and do something like that as well so yeah in answer to your question we don't have we don't have a multicultural policy we don't our first nations policy is not really an arts and culture policy it's a i'm saying sorry without actually saying sorry kind of policy yeah, yeah. like yeah um there's no kind of cohesion around any of that um there's no statecraft to it there's there's not a there is like within it when i say statecraft i mean at the national level um so the, <laughs> sorry i just painted a really bad picture i but the flip side is that the cultural policy if you like it comes from us it comes from the sector and so far because there are so many good people it's it's that's kind of been okay but that is risky <laughs> that's a risky scenario <laughs> Okay, well, the group so far has just elected Wesley Enoch Prime Minister. And can I say, what a great development. I think Australia is <laughs> going to be all the richer uh, for this very important appointment um, and that uh, we can all look forward to a bright and thrilling future. Wesley's presence on our board uh, is uh, truly uh, uh, inspirational. Um, and, um, yeah, I think his voice in Australia is very, very welcomed. I believe Wesley is co-hosting the Visual Art the, uh, the First Nations Awards, and not just Visual Arts, the First Nations Art Awards tonight. Uh, so you can you can uh, get more of your Wesley Enoch fix on that. But also <laughs> Wesley um, and Adina Dixon were our guests um, on this NAVA advocacy program a few weeks ago, and so you can see the um, uh, you can see the uh, the you can play back the video of that by um, going to um, that uh, page on our on our website. Um, maybe the other way of asking that question of what our policies, and someone's posed the question a little bit further up, which is um, um, how would someone who is not Australian view Australia's cultural policy? And I guess that would depend on where they're from and the lens that they're bringing. But certainly as, um, you know, an, an, an artist visiting Australia, you, you could be quite confused as to um, what the feeling is. Oh, Caroline's got to go. Thank you, Caroline. See you next time. Um, you, you can be quite confused as to what that is, particularly because there are such differences between states and some of our states are very internationally focused, aren't they? Well, I think if you, I, uh, not being a migrant to Australia, I was born in Australia, but um, I, I feel like internationals uh, you guys who are internationals could speak to this better than me but um you probably confuse our cultural policy with our tourism policy like really australia's international yes. face is is a tourism face it's very yeah. much about um the beautiful landscape and you know the kind of tourist experiences that you can have here um you know i mean that's a starting point for mm. for a public for an outward facing Kind of face of australia um mm. yeah i hope people don't still think of neighbors but oh, it's highly God. likely it's <laughs> highly likely <laughs> you know um, although i was born here i am twice a migrant to australia so when i was quite little we moved back to greece forever um and then we came back and then i moved to germany and uh then also returned and so i've had that experience of particularly working in germany where i mean uh, again as we talked about the you know, 
half a billion dollars that they've spent so far during this time. It's just, it really is a whole other planet in terms of, you know, that, that broader um, policy context. Um, but it's also um, looking at now, um, um, if we go to a couple of those places in the English speaking world, particularly the US, where there is no national ministry, there's no minister for the arts. Um, but um, we've got a question from Sharon that, um, Nathani, uh, who's also been reinforced by Louise Rollman, um, about um, your view, Jackie, on the role of philanthropy in shaping the arts. Because, of course, in the US, there is a massive philanthropy culture, but it also um, infuses organizational governance. It's not unusual for a board in an American organization to have 30 or 40 board members um, who are overseeing the organization, but they are also, um, you know, it's that give, get or get off. They are major contributors. Um, and of course, in other countries where um, philanthropy, patronage, uh, the expectation that you contribute a great deal, but you also, um, uh, you might also have a, 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 a policy voice. Um, what's your um, kind of global benchmark sense on, on the role of philanthropy in, in shaping the arts around the world? Yeah, I think um, yeah, in the States is the obvious example where philanthropy has the biggest impact. Like individual philanthropists have had a huge impact on their arts and cultural landscape. Um, Europe not as much. It's not that they don't have a tradition of philanthropy, but they have such a strong tradition of public support that philanthropy is is kind of less impactful, but still big, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, Australia, again, le less and uh, most of the philanthropy in the arts has come from European migration um, in a, to Australia, and yeah. which is, like, fantastic. Um, as far as, yeah, my, I mean, I haven't done a study of that, but that's my that's what it seems like just thinking about the bulk yeah of arts giving um certainly, oh yes um particularly those post-war um, post -war who, had, migrants, um yeah. who had directly experienced um uh the nazi regime um and then that has led to yeah, a range of um yeah the, the the impact of 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 war on european migrants is is absolutely the bulk of yeah so i mean i'd, I'd say in australia um, the role of philanthropists in guiding, uh, in shaping the arts and culture, obviously through where they spend their money, but also who they talk to, you know, in terms of the corridors of power kind of thing and um, who they can communicate with. Um, because the pub, uh, the government is still the biggest funder in Australia, you know, of, of the arts. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, the other thing is just, I wouldn't think of philanthropists as like the white knight of the arts either because it's great. We want more philanthropy, absolutely. But you, you do get into that kind of murky area that, that the, the US has where arts and culture becomes, you know, it's, it's a commodity and as opposed to in Europe, not that Europe is like the best at all, but um, arts and culture is a bit more like the commons, a little bit more like the commons, yes. like, um, yes. you know, it's just part of life kind of thing. Not for everybody because there's obviously class disadvantage, um, but it's just a different kind of vibe to it. And uh, philanthropy comes with a lot of sort of status and legacy stuff, um, which is fine. But then there's that weird sort of gift debt relationship that can be set up. So... I don't have it. I don't have a problem with philanthropy. Philanthropy is great, <laughs> but I wouldn't. I, but I still think that arts should get most of its um, s support from the public purse because that just keeps it as a creative commons, as a cultural yeah. commons for people. It's like the culture part of the arts and culture. Um, yes, yeah. yes, and and a public good. I mean, um, I, I am of course um, culturally obliged as a Greek person to make constant reference to how key words come from the Greek language and then apply them in some kind of seemingly <laughs> irrelevant way. But philanthropy, of course, uh, means a, a love for other people, and one of the reasons why that um, um, that culture of government. Um, support for the arts. Uh, thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, one of the reasons why government support for the arts is so big in Europe is because the government is seen as a philanthropist. Um, 
that this is a, a public good. Um, and that is, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's historical, um, absolutely. But it's, um, you know, regardless of, you know, left, right, whatever, um, you know, regardless of, of the government that's in power, obviously there, there are issues around um, uh, art propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it is a culture that I very much wish that Australia could emulate. Now we're heading into the last 15 minutes. Our conversations in the NAVA Advocacy Program always fly by. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's coming up next so that we can then spend our last 10 minutes uh, making the very most of, um, of, of Jackie's time with us. So I'm now going to share my screen um, and I'm very much hoping that that is going to come across. I'm going to update the handbook uh, for weeks um, five to eight very soon. Again, this is our handbook, which is um, available for uh, NAVA members. Um, and speaking of philanthropy, with thanks to the generosity of Daniel Beeson is, is, is how this program is, is even possible. Um, I have there on the, um, it's like the eighth page of um, the kit, um, there is um, a very brief history of arts policy in Australia. This is partly your homework for next week, is to make sure if you're another member that you've gone and, and downloaded um, uh, this kit, which I, I will update before then as well, with a couple of new things, including Jackie's um, uh, diagram. So I'm noticing people posting uh, there. Uh, we, we will have that information up there. And again, and thank you to Leah for just posting the link to the advocacy uh, kit, um, which is the this this handbook. Um, the um, the 2020. Um, advocacy program handbook is available just for NAVA members uh, because if we if we didn't NAVA members would would scold me enormously this program of course is is available our talks um, and they're available on the website uh, freely to everyone um, and um, um, and Angela's just pointing out the invisible budget for the other two months in terms of becoming a NAVA member. NAVA membership starts from as little as $7.50 a month, which is just the cost of a couple of coffees or a very elaborate donut. Someone was telling me about the other day. Did you know there are donuts that cost between seven and ten dollars each? I was not aware of this. So if you forego one of these donuts, uh, you can you can uh, hop on as another member and access all of our resources and information, our dedicated artist support development, best practice through the code of practice, um, and uh, all the various other. Um, um, benefits of, of being a NAVA member. Next week, we're going to look at achieving policy goals. Um, you may recall that at the end of last year, there was a government restructure and the Department of Communications and the Arts has been merged in uh, with a range of, um, of other portfolios. It's actually quite a good set of portfolios. It's there among regional development and other great colleagues. But unfortunately, they dropped the name of the arts off the, the portfolio uh, title. And um, though this restructure happened, um, only five public servants lost their job and learnt about this through the media, unfortunately. One of those to lose his job was Mike Murdoch AO, the former secretary of the former Department of Communications and the Arts. So last year's government restructure rendered the arts invisible in the name of its new portfolio. How might this impact on achieving policy outcomes? And what was the top priority? What were the top priorities for the former department's former secretary before he unexpectedly lost his job? Uh, that's the question that we're going to be asking next week. Um, so zooming right back into Australia and looking at if we look at what's happened since that unexpected restructure of must be November, December last year now, um, if we look at, um, you know, the, the challenge that um, our, our colleagues at the Australia Council and at the Office for the Arts have been facing in supporting their colleagues across government in understanding what's needed for the industry at this time. Um, it's difficult um, 
not to draw the conclusion that um, the department has been rendered more invisible. So we will hear from Mike next week. Thank you to Jackie for posting uh, the link to your blog post um, with the graphs and the various details. Um, and um, thank you to Anna for posting the link to the Currency House recording of Nick Schlieper's uh, brilliant um, uh, 2017 Philip Parsons lecture on the complex state of arts funding. There's been a lot of work that's been done this year in particular uh, by a lot of commentators on um, arts funding in Australia and what's next. Um, and of course, a lot of the what's next is up to all of us. Uh, to bring us back to the COVID-19 conversation, which, you know, I, I know we all adore, uh, I'm going to share my screen um, and um, uh, which I believe is that button, um, yes open in browser mm. um, and I want to share one Chrome tab and it's that one and I'm pressing the button now and hopefully you can see that um, and so to let me know in the chat if you can um, what we've got there is um, Nava's draft submission to the COVID-19 Senate inquiry now tomorrow Thursday the 28th of May is the deadline for the federal, the, the, the Senate inquiry into the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We've got um, some information here on how to write a submission to an inquiry. We've got our draft submission there for you to download as a Word document or you can just scroll right down and read the draft submission. It's in, it's quite lengthy. <laughs> you go, oh God, God, it is quite lengthy. I've got to revise this by tomorrow. Um, it is quite lengthy. It's in three sections, um, gaps in the Australian government's COVID-19 response to the creative industries, the lost opportunity for a creative industries led approach to economy wide recovery and priorities to enrich Australia's cultural life. So please use as much or as little of this as you like in preparing your own submission from your point of view. Um, there's some helpful guidance here, which also quotes from um, the Australian Parliament's advice on how to make a submission uh, to a government inquiry, uh, clearly addressing things, uh, being concise, um, giving a brief introduction about yourself and telling us about your practice or your organisation and how, how this has affected you, perhaps you know, giving what in effect would be a case study from your point of view. Um, and in particular, avoiding um, not just things that are overly complex, but things that, that criticise people because then um, it, um, uh, if it looks like you're... you're um, submission might defame someone, uh, then it's not likely to be considered or published. But also, as we say um, in the um, NAVA Advocacy Program Handbook, what are some great ways to do um, good advocacy and, and what makes for, for great advocacy? Um, it is very much about uh, putting forward your vision with confidence and positivity, uh, being constructive and compelling um, without attack or complaint, which can undermine your great arguments. And to be really clear here, it's really important that we're critical. The draft submission that we've put together is very critical. Um, it talks about some serious failures in the Australian government's response so far, things that could have been done differently. But we can talk about problems and failures um, without being, um, uh, you know, without sort of resorting to uh, insult and attack, because when we do that, people switch off to the, to, to the kinds of things that, that, that we're saying. Um, so that's the draft submission. Um, it's, it's on the NAVA website. It's, it's gone out to all NAVA members and subscribers in the NAVA news today. Um, and it is right there. So that is... Um, part of your um, homework 
um, for, in fact, well, for tonight, for overnight, um, is to write a submission um, and, to, and to send that in by tomorrow. Um, the other thing that we're going to start to look at, and, and um, uh, curious to know who has contacted their local MP or, or their MP ever since um, we discussed this last week, because the parliament is going to sit next the week after next. And we've all got a lot of work to do um, in the next two weeks to make sure that the treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, uh, is completely across uh, what all the issues are. But the, the immediate homework is write your submission and, and send that in by tomorrow. And then also the homework for the next week is to connect with um, your local member, use the Australia Council's electorate profile tool. Oh, good on you, Adam. Thank you very much. So Adam has uh, connected and sent a copy of, of my article. Thanks, Adam. Um, We've got, you know, the entire NAVA website is full of all that cheat sheet stuff on, on, on what to say. But also the important thing is to start to build that relationship. So simply get in touch, give them a call, tag them into social media and say, I'm an artist um, or I run an organisation or, or I'm a member of a certain organisation. Um, and these are key issues for me at the moment. When Parliament sits again the week after next, I want you to raise these things. Uh, I, or I'm from your electorate. This is how my studio, my gallery, my organisation is struggling. That could change if policy was changed in this particular area. And you'll find a list of those priorities in that um, uh, in the, um, the, the the draft submission. So we've just got a few minutes. I'm just going to remind myself how to shift. Um, um, our views that you can see that. Oh, thank you, Leah. I think Leah's just done that. In just a few minutes left, has anyone got some final questions for Jackie? Or Jackie, um, um, any final insights from you um, in the range of things that we've just talked about? I'm so, so grateful for your perspective tonight. No, it's been a pleasure. It's been a good chat. Um, do I have anything to add? I would say that um, in the next little while, like some yes. of the leaders. What does the future look like? Yeah. Yeah, what does the future look like? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, upsurge in nationalism, yeah. recessionary conditions, yeah. um, you know, local versus global. Mm. I think mm. it's not all bad, though. Like, I think arts artists are going to be hard-pressed, but we're going to be really more essential than ever if we want, you know, a peaceful, integrated society. I don't yeah. know if government will fund that. I don't know if they'll recognise that. But just, you know, the, the sort of person-to-person -person ethical responsibilities, that's artists are going to be really important in that, really integral. I mean, there might be scope in terms of leveraging the role of artists in, I wouldn't call it social cohesion for this current government, but maybe stability, um, security, cultural security maybe, um, yeah. because there will be a big emphasis on you know, food security, med tech security, mm. water security, like <laughs> advanced manufacturing security. So why not cultural security? Throw that in the mix. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, you might be able to leverage that into, uh, for advocacy purposes. Mm. Um, I think it's a great way of putting it. I mean, especially considering, so on the one hand, on a very pragmatic level, uh, as we were saying earlier, in the absence of international tourism, um, when we look at mm. uh, the way that we um, engage and connect with each other, um, uh, the states will be competing with each other for tourists from each other's states. And that, of course, essentially involves the show, the festival, the biennale, the event that, that you're going to see. And yeah, in that's, that's true. Where yeah, in a situation where um, live performance um, uh, will not be able to return in numbers and uh, the visual arts will be leading in terms of galleries and other self-directed experiences, um, that's going to be, you know, really important for, for so many people. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the main reasons people attend arts as you would know, is, um, is social. It's, it's actually about social interaction and it's about identity. It's about seeing yeah. oneself and feeling seen. And so if, though, if you can capture those things and, you know, bring people back to the, to the live and the tangible in a safe way, um, you'll be doing people a great service. But there will be a real issue around inequity after all of this because, um, 
because Australian companies are forced to be so reliant on private, you know, on earned income, yeah. um, there's going to be inequities in terms of who can access the live experience. So, you know, not to paint too grim a picture, but um, artists are going to have to just work harder than ever because we're going to be more important than ever, even though people won't be necessarily uh, valuing it with money. <laughs> um, but it's times like these that you kind of you need your artists to speak the truth and to keep people s sort of spiritually safe. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Jackie, thank you so, so very much for joining us this evening um, I, and, and echoing um, what uh, Renu and others are saying to thank you for the solid research and analytical work. Um, and we will be, be sharing um, um, all of that as well. This has been, yeah, another great, great session. So everyone, thank you. See you again uh, from four o'clock. Uh, next week Australian Eastern Standard Time and if you've got the time this evening don't forget from six o'clock um, is the First Nations Arts Awards as well um, so big thank you Jackie and good night everyone thank you <laughs> bye <laughs> bye everyone